Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Life and Reference Bar after our night off on Tuesday. Uh, unfortunately, the ever-moving feast that is the EFL and their plan to bring football back meant we had to postpone Josh going on Tuesday night. But fingers crossed he's back on the Thursday, 4th of June. In terms of tonight, session number 14, which is crazy, really. And after interviews with legends of the game, such as Mick McCarthy, Neil Redfern, Viv Anderson and Craig Ignit, we're absolutely ripping the rule book up and uh, switching it to something completely different tonight. We're going super local for the next hour or so and taking this challenge on BFC volunteer group to BFC volunteer group. And we're pushing our tech capabilities to the max, but more on that as we go through it. Firstly, though, if you're watching, you're not familiar with the film Daydream Believers, where have you been for the last couple of years? Because uh, tonight we're lucky to be joined by Chris and Liam, who had the idea, developed it and then led a crew and created this, created this amazing story of how a football team made a town believe again. Good evening, gents. Good evening. Hi, Matt. How are you both doing? Really good, thank you. Yeah, considering everything that's going on, can't complain. You're the uh, you're the finest double act we've had on here since Andy Ritchie and Rick Holden, but I'm uh, oh. hoping you'll be slightly easier to manage. <laughs> I'm just going to be Andy Ritchie. Uh, I, I, I'll be Rick. I'll just be stroking and grooming for the next yeah. couple of hours, like. Well, you're getting there with the facial hair. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, first of all. Look, we're going to talk about, I don't, know, I don't know whether to call it a, a making of or a behind the scenes, but obviously, you know, we're, we're doing these interviews to keep people entertained during lockdown and while they stay inside, etc. How did this all come about? When did Daydream Believers become an idea? Well, I'm That's because it was my idea. Um, I think, um, interestingly, that it was kind of, so obviously I used to be involved with West Ham Bogs. And it was the 20th anniversary of the promotion season. So we were doing like just some special um, interviews with people that were involved during that. And I spent a good few hours with John Dennis sort of talking about his time at the club and sort of that period. And right at that time, Leeds United released a documentary called Do You Want to Win? Which was um, the sort of Howard Wilkinson story. And I watched that and I remember thinking to myself, like, Leeds winning the first division, is, it's not a story. It's not, a, it's not something that gets people interested other than Leeds fans. And I remember saying to John, saying, do you think um, people would be interested if we like, turned it into something proper? He's like, yeah, absolutely no doubt. And Chris and I had got to know each other a little bit over the few years prior. And um, Chris is a sort of freelance cameraman director. And I think most people that come from like a creative background and are Barnsley fans have thought about this. Like there'll be lots of people that will look at the story and gone, this could be something. In fact, Simon, who ended up being the composer for the film, I remember him and I got drunk in number seven a few years ago and we were both saying, wouldn't it be class if? So like a bit of a circle and it came back around and we, we basically made it. So I spoke to Chris and said like, could this happen? And... 18 months later, it did. So it was one of those, like, a bit of a meeting where we, we'd both had this idea. We both wanted to make it happen. Chris could technically make it happen. Uh, I just sort of ch helped try and organise it a little bit. And these, these things cost money, um, obviously. We, and yeah. I know you guys did the crowdfund. Were you, were you blown away by how successful that was? How, how, how did it all start and how did you go about it? I'm going to let Liam go again because this is his side of it. <laughs> yeah, so I get all boring stuff, basically, is what he's saying. <laughs> Um, so yeah, well, overall, I think the film cost us in the region about forty grand to make it, um, which like various costs that sort of come with it, from licensing to shoots to everything else. Um, but we were really clear early doors that we wanted this to be a non-commercial effort, and we wanted this to be sort of in, um, we wanted it to be to benefit the town. So. We had, a, again, a West Ham Bogs night at the Metrodome where it was like the 20th anniversary uh, reunion. Um, and that was, I think, in the June of 2017, maybe early July. And Chris and I had been talking throughout sort of the spring. 
um, and said, look, the only way that this is ever going to work is if we've got a bit of cash to, to even just start it. Um, obviously, him and I haven't got out. So it were like, right, let's let's see what we can get. So came up with this idea of crowdfunding. We'd obviously had a bit of a track record when it came to like, Stan Boggs raising a few quid and we'd built a bit of a following and a bit of social media sort of uh, numbers. So we put this crowdfunding appeal out that said, right, give us 20 quid and guarantee your DVD. With a name, I think I was raising about five grand um, to just give us the opportunity to go and film four or five days um, with people. Um, and I think we reached five grand in three days. Um, yeah, it were crackers. People giving a thousand pound, people sort of taking up these extra packages that we'd um, put forward. And I think we ended up raising about 15K um, overall over about a three week period. Which really then I think it was at that point where we both looked at each other and thought, do you know what, we can make this properly. Like I think we're always going to do something, but the fact that we raised so much money so quickly, and that was only just through sort of social media and sort of a very limited reach that we thought there's an audience for this. So it gave us a lot of confidence then actually to be able to go out and almost alter our own expectations of the quality of what we wanted to put in front of people. So yeah, it were crackers, mate. Like absolutely, I remember that watching the money roll in after we'd launched it. Uh, uh, on the Sunday, I think it was. And I just couldn't get my head around it. So, yeah, that gave us a lot of confidence early doors that we could actually make it real. Uh, and I know when you when you launched that crowdfund, the big thing was you needed some money to try and get the TV footage and everything. How, how big a hurdle was that to, to kind of get over with Sky and BBC or whoever? Um, we, uh, we had to approach the club and ask them to give us a letter of authentication that it's... Um, but it's going to be a club product, which helps massively. And the fact because we made it a non-for-profit film also helps yeah. negate a few of the costs. We luckily, so there's somebody at the, I can't remember his name, which is terrible, but there's somebody at the BBC, who I think called Liam Neal, who was a bit of a Barnsley fan, and he helped yeah. us get some of the stuff. Chris Trees, weren't it? I bet. Liam and Noah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 He, 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 basically, yeah, Chris gave us access to be able to say, like, these things exist, and then we had to go through the right channels to be able to sort of pull it down and get the right um, yeah. access to it and stuff. And Sky, um, Sky were pretty good. Like we said to Sky yeah. what it was, and they would literally send you a copy of everything they have from that time period. With It's called a burnt-in time code. And then we would have to watch it and go through it and go, we'll have that bit, we'll have that bit. Not that Jeez. bit. You can add up how much each minute's going to cost. <laughs> so you'd be yeah. like, you have to go through it and just went through hours of footage of just news items and we'd select all the bits you want. Then you tell them what you want. Then you pay for it. And then they send you like the high resolution copy of it. Some yeah. shopping list that. But, yeah. Yeah. It cr- and like, like Chris said, the fact that, that it was a not for profit meant that everybody really supportive, but the what you start to realize very quickly is just what it does cost so you're talking thousands per minute of footage um so we had to work with partners including getty we had to work with the fa to be able to get fa cup licenses we had bbc we had um, itv sky sports like all of these third parties that own the licenses for this footage we had to go and sort of with a begging ball and go any chance but and when you don't know anybody in that world or anybody in that game, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a merry-go-round until you can find the right person to talk to. So um, it was very time-consuming. But again, the the support that we got were cracking. Like with the fact that everybody were really, really supportive. And if we'd not had the right archive, it'd have never been the same. So yeah, I think I all, that. honestly, I think it also helps that the club in question is Barnsley and not like yeah. Manchester United. Yeah. I think if you were asking for footage on Manchester United, Manchester City, um, you probably won't get the same access. But because it's Barnsley, people went, oh, yeah, yeah, cool. And they helped us out a lot with that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm guessing the challenge after that is then getting access to some of the players. How, how did you track them all down? Um, well, we were, again, we had the West Ham Bogs link, so we'd have a lot of people that we knew. And then Chris knew a few of the lads um, from various things as well. Um, I mean, my brother in law, they were great, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that helped. My brother in law is uh, Nicky Eden. Oh, there you so go. <laughs> obviously, that, <laughs> that kind of cuts down a few bridges. Um, so that helped. And obviously, like Liam said before about John Dennis um, and knowing him from writing the article, he helped contact Danny. And then because John put his name behind it, people trusted it more. Then it, yeah. it wasn't just a couple of fans saying, Can we do some stuff? Even if you skip right to the end. On the night of the premiere, there were some players there who went, didn't realise it was going to be a proper film. 
<laughs> <laughs> and they didn't realize how it was a proper professional film but that so it, it was tough but um yeah we had we had a lot of help thankfully that's a that's a compliment there looks like we've lost liam um, and, did, and did you have i mean obviously nick is your brother-in-law but did you have a favorite list for who you wanted in terms of players and did anybody turn um, you down nobody turned us down um we literally made a list of everybody um, and we went through and said who we thought would be attainable we want you want the main people you want Hendry, Redfern, you know, Clint. Um, and we went through the list and we picked who we thought and then we approached people and we did it and everybody was fantastic. And one of the most amazing things about it was was how much, how much respect and how much feeling each player had for that period in time. And that's why they did it. Because when we sat down and spoke to them, you could just, they were so proud of it. You know, it's such an amazing achievement. And a lot of players in that team never thought they would get promoted to Premier League for any team, you know, some of them will come into the end of the, co- end of the careers and it's just an, an incredible thing. I think that's what helped to win them round to come be interviewed. And then that last question before we go on to the first clip, why Daydream Believers? What other, what other names were in the running? Um, there was another name um, originally. I think it's even on some of the original clips we put out. It was going to be called Achieving the Unachievable. Oh, I've that seen that, the, yeah. Yeah, when we interviewed Danny, that was one of his answers. And when we did the interview, so Liam did the interview and I did the filming. And when he left, Liam said, like, did you hear what he said? I said, what? And he said, he said, achieving the unachievable. And we were like, great now. And then we went away and then we thought about different stuff. And then once Daydream Believers got mentioned, it kind of, we just thought that really fitted because it's a nice name for a film. If you're not a Barnsley fan, but if you are a Barnsley fan, you get the link to the Mark McGee song. And, you know, it's, it's yeah. that's what we went Interestingly, for. I think when we look back, like the first conversation Chris and I had, um, we wrote out like, a bit of a summary of what we wanted it to be. And um, I remember I found out the photo that I'd sent to him, like after his conversation. And it said there, Daydream Believers, working title. So we actually started, the first thing we ever talked about was, Daydream Believers, because of what, everything that Chris said there in terms of you've got the little nod to the, the history. If you're a Barnsley fan, it makes sense in terms of obviously like to a, a broader audience. But we did go around it, but um, it just felt really right, didn't it? It sort of rolled off the tongue and it meant something. So, yeah. So at, at this point, we're going to try and play the first of six short clips. So I alluded to it earlier with, you know, it's going to be 50-50 on whether it works or not. Um, so not only have I got to hit the right clip in the right order and have the sound turned on, um, depending on those of you that are watching, where you're watching it from, how strong your internet connection is, that'll, de- that'll determine the quality. Um, and this is probably where pre-recorded over live, over live has its appeal. But, you know, we're going to go with it. Sound is more important than pictures. So fingers crossed this works. The pictures and the noise offer fulsome evidence of how football is booming in Barnsley. For the last two hours, the thousands have made the trek from the centre of the town in an atmosphere whose warmth belonged to an age gone by. And here inside Oakwell, an all-ticket crowd of nearly 34,000, and for the second time this season, a new record in gate receipts. Over the years, the deeds of Barnsley have made only a few headlines, but their place in football's folklore has long been assured by names like Blanchlar, Normanton, Brook, Tilson and Tommy Taylor. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. Good evening. Never in living memory has Britain seen such a long and bitter industrial struggle as the present miners' strike. By 1981, bitterness had erupted into violence on a spectacular scale. From London to Liverpool. But the biggest cost of the government strategy was the record level of unemployment. It led to this recreation of the 1930s Jarrow March. During the 80s, it really, it was really a struggle. The economic fortunes of the town had suffered a, a, a serious decline as the um, mining industry 
um, was being horrifically contracted in a very, very short space of time. It was the erosion of the traditional industrial base and the drive towards greater efficiency laced with fundamental political confrontation that lay behind the biggest social clash of Mrs Thatcher's regime, the year-long miners' strike. The, the, the miners' strike of 84-85 was the biggest event, I think, in, in domestic politics since the war. I think the way Margaret Thatcher and that Tory government dealt with the working class in England was with a conscious, a, a cruelty of which they were fully conscious. All right, lads, I think we're back. Um, it's a pretty powerful opening scene. Look, the, the film combines the success of the promotion season with a look back at those devastating effects of the miners' strike. Was it difficult striking the balance of that message and, and how did you figure out getting it right? Uh, yeah, it was difficult, but it was something we both strongly wanted to put in the film. Without that context, it becomes a bit of a two-season review. So we really wanted to put in place what it meant to the town and the people and the fans. And we spent a long time looking at hours of archive from news stories about that time. Because you'll notice, technically wise, there's no voiceover on the opening. So we had to try and find clips that basically told you the story through the news readers about them. Um, which was difficult, but I just think it was worth it. I love the opening, um, especially the, I love the first bit. I love the game against Man City and how busy the ground is. And I go uh, just to go from that to the minor strike is is, is a, a harsh contrast. And uh, the, I think, the, go on, Liam. Sorry, I was, the the circle as you come around later on, obviously with that like Barry Davis is just a genius, like with the way that those words roll off his tongue and sort of the way that he sort of describes that scene and then. The fact that he's then the one that's on commentary on the, the first game of the Premier League and he's the one introducing that as well would just, again, I thought a really nice touch, actually. And, and, and I know you got Ken Loach involved. Was, was he nothing but supportive in terms of what you were trying to do and the motives yeah. behind it, etc.? It was great. I think Liam reached out and tried to contact his company and they, would, they said, come down. So he's got an office in Soho. So we literally drove there and back in a day, went down, met him top floor in this little office right in, in, in the attic space. Set up, he came in, had a, had a chat, he asked about it all, and he gave us a 30, 35 minute interview. It was lovely, it was really good. Yeah, he was, he was class, because like, um, what's really, what's funny about that day is um, we drove straight back up after, because um, what we're trying to do is obviously save as much cash as we could, so every day that we hired Kit, you had to make use of it. So driving to London to go and do a half an hour interview felt like a bit of a, bit of a stretch so we actually arranged it for the day that we played Burton at home under Mirish that when he just joined so we'd had this great day where we were talking like obviously all day about the film and that we've been seeing Ken Loach and we've driven home and then we've seen that we'd lost 3-1 or some at home to Burton and um, we were doing some crowd shots weren't we like yeah. around the ground and whatever else so it was really interesting because all we did for two years were look at how good we were um, in the mid 90s and just watched all these clips and all these sort of films of us being incredible at football alongside us being absolutely awful. So um, it was a nice little contrast driving back up M1 that day. We uh, we, could, we could have done with your uh, film crew in the dressing room at half-time with the alleged uh, Jose, the, Jose <laughs> the cat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. for, that, that's for another interview. Uh, look, John Dennis features throughout. You know, over the years, he's been more than happy to be open and talk about his time at Barnsley over the years as owner. Was he as easy to work with as he comes across whenever he's speaking about the club? Hey, he was hey, he's a, a gentleman. Yeah, he is a proper gentleman. And from the first minute I met him, all the way through helping with the film to the lamp room and everything that he helped set up was first class. And even since the film, still talk to him. And he is a, he's a gentleman. Mm, I think um, what really comes across from John is just how much this football club and town means to him and his family like you think of the the blood sweat and tears that went into um leaving what is a really lasting legacy for the football club i mean you just need to look around Oatwell and see what the dennis family did for us i know it ended on a bit of a sour note um but you, what we got was the chance to meet and spend a lot of time with a really 
sort of humble, smart and caring bloke for that, for this football club. So, yeah, it was a, a genuine joy to spend time with him. Yeah, because that was going to be my next question was, of all the people that you spoke to and everyone that was involved in the film, was it John that was the most emotional going through all the memories? Uh, yeah, I mean, he was. No. I, well, I know what you're going to say. I'll, Go on. <laughs> there's, there's one player who we interviewed, if he's going to sell the same story, I don't know. We interviewed one player. Towards the end, actually, we decided to go and speak to him. And we did the interview when we sat there. And when they left the room, we were all like, wow. It was like he just relived it back in his mind. And it was Scott Jones. And we went oh, through wow. the Man United game. And he went through it all. And he just spoke so well about how much it meant to him. And how he didn't really realise it at the time. But it was like he realised then that he never, he never bet that. That night, in terms of a career, working career, he's never going to get higher than that. You know, scoring two goals against Manchester United. And obviously then it went off to leave Barnsley and whatever. It just kind of clicked with him then and it just showed us all how much it meant to each individual person. But yeah, Scott was class. And when he told us that story, we were, we were all a bit, when he left, we all went, wow. <laughs> was that what you were going to say? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So there's a, it's actually in the film we talks about, um, we asked everybody to sort of summarise the memories of that period almost at the end of every interview. And he said something along the lines of, I miss it all. I miss the fans. I miss the club. I miss the people because I had it all and I just miss it. And you've got like a real, there's a moment where we all go a bit of a lump in the throat, being a sort of mid twenties um, and re- not realising that you'd got everything that you'd ever wanted in your life. And then 20 years later, looking back and going, yeah, downhill from that point must be really hard. But yeah, that that was the one that did it for me. It was Scott, definitely. God, that's a really interesting uh, insight. Well, look, there's, there's hours of footage that don't make the film, um, which we're going to take a look over the next 45 minutes as you've been kind enough to share some of it to us exclusively to share. Did um, did you get a sense talking to John? Because we've got a clip of uh, John Dennis talking about Ken Bates. Did you get a sense that it was Barnsley versus the Premier League when you were talking to him? And the other players, actually. Um, I think you got a sense just how much John wanted to represent this town well. And he wanted to... He, I think John was the perfect chairman for us in that in that season because he'd seen it all and he'd been there when it was bad. And he wanted so much for the football club to represent something that was professional and for it to almost do itself justice. Um I think if you're from Barnsley, you recognise what it's got. If you're not from the area, then obviously you can look down on it and you can have like a bit, there's a bit of a sneer and a bit of a perception around it. But I think if you're from the town, you almost want people to look at it in the way that you look at it. Uh, and John wanted to really sort of progress that image of the town and the, the, the image of the football club. And I think that's the same for all the players. I know Chris mentioned it earlier on, but when you talk to them all, they all had the same... They, they they all cared. They all bought into the place, into the community, and into the football club. And I think a lot of them look back at it as the sort of pinnacle, both in terms of the career and some of them in terms of their lives, in terms of the times that they had with their best mates in in this place. So, um, yeah, I, you definitely got to sense that it meant more to John without a shadow of a doubt. Well, look, we've got we've got another clip here, so I'm going to share this one. But this is John talking about a certain Ken Bates. Obviously, first big TV game of the season for us, Chelsea at home. Couldn't get much bigger than that with the stars that they got. Ken Bates and his colleagues were not um, strangers to us. And in fact, at the end the day. Anyway, fast forward to us playing Chelsea. Barry Taylor, of course, was... Um, obviously... First big TV game of the season for us, Chelsea at home. Couldn't get much bigger than that with the stars that they got. Ken Bates and his colleagues were not um, strangers to us. And in fact, at the, the, f- the first meeting, the first event at which I had represented Barnsley as a Premier League club, had been at the, um, at the Premier League Chairman's Conference at a very nice hotel near Stratford-upon-Avon. 
it, it had been a, it was a, a fascinating day, followed by a dinner in the evening, which culminated in some ribaldry between Mr. Bates and myself and the then chairman of Newcastle United, Sir John Hall. As we're hoping for a family audience with this film, I won't go into the details of the right Baldry, uh, but suffice it to say, I thought, right, Mr. Bates, I'll sort you out one day. Anyway, fast forward to us playing Chelsea. Barry Taylor, of course, was um, on the FA Council, as was Ken Bates. And Ken had said to Barry um, at an FA meeting a few weeks beforehand, I see we've got you on a Sunday. If there's, a, if there's any restaurants fit to eat in round your way, we might come up and have dinner with you. So Barry, Barry told me that. I said, hey, all right then. We'll take it to Armstrong's on Doddworth Road because they were going to be staying at uh, Whitley Hall. So, yeah, Barry said, good idea. I'll do that. I said, um, I said I'll, I'll get some transport laid on for Ken and his wife and Colin Hutchinson, who was their chief exec. I asked one of my senior guys at work whether they'd mind giving up a Saturday night to go and pick Ken Bates up and bring him to, to Armstrong's. He said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I said, but I don't want you to go straight to Armstrong's. I said, you know that Cypriot Chinese, uh, that, that Cypriot fish and chip shop at the bottom of Dodgers Road? He says, yeah. I said, drive past Armstrong's, pull up outside the chip shop, and tell Mr. Bates and his colleagues that Mr. Dennis and Mr. Taylor and the wives will be in the back bit where there's a red and white tablecloth. So he did it. <laughs> so when Ken and his partner and Colin came into Armstrong's, I think they saw the funny side of it, but um, it didn't get the evening off to a great start. But I thought it was funny. That was me, by the way. I tried to turn the volume up and it skipped it 25 seconds. So it's just proof that we're live, you know. <laughs> um, look, uh, let's talk about the players now. Did, um, did they all travel to you or did you travel to meet them? We travelled to them, uh, more, basic, more or less. Uh, we actually did two interviews in this room where I am at home. <laughs> um, when we were making the trailer, because we didn't have the funds, we did um, AD Moses and Nick Eden, we did here. Um, we used the bar at the lamp room for Danny's interview. Um, and we used the Spencers. Is it Spencers at Cawthorn? We used their little yeah. back room as well. We, we, we pulled in so many favours from people and that we knew all the friends of friends. So we got the Spencers. Um, um, so Harrison, um, I forget his name, who used to be on Chris the board. Harry. Chris Harrison, yeah. So Chris. Uh, let us have the function room at the Spencers to interview Eric and John. We got um, John who helps, who runs the who runs Opium. We interviewed uh, Redders in Opium in the middle of the day with a, in the middle of a building site. So that was a good laugh. Um, and we we did like, I think it was Tankers of Manor. Yeah, we did, and then we also went over to Liverpool to meet Jan, didn't we? And then. Yeah. The big the big trip was um, we went over to Holland to meet Ariane, which were well worth it as a, a long couple of days. But mm. um, yeah, we, we pulled in every favour that we possibly could just to find a, a space that was quiet. Yeah, we went when we did Yam. We just had to go to his hotel in Liverpool because he was doing Champions League um, for oh, yeah. like Sky Germany, whatever he does it for. So we went to his hotels um, mm. and just booked a suite. And when he got time, he came down, met us. The room, there was nothing in the room. It looked terrible. We were going, oh, no. But it looks all right in the end. But, yeah, and we did Jan there. So we just had to just go wherever we could. If somebody said we could, they could do a certain time and we could do it, then we'd just travel and, and, and get it done, basically. And for those of us who've seen the film, we know how impressive Ashley Ward's house looked, but just yeah. how amazing is Ashley Ward's house? Oh, incredible. <laughs> I mean, it takes 10 minutes on the drive to get up to our house. Yeah. We, we were driving up going, oh, my word. He's got three front rooms. <laughs> yeah. And I always remember we um, we were, we pulled up, and I think uh, Dawn, his wife, was in the middle of recording something, or was going to be recording something for um, Housewives of Cheshire. And we were setting up in one room, and then we had to be shifted to the other. But then we were asked to go downstairs, and then we came back upstairs. It, it is absolutely mental. 
Like, but again, what a what a lovely fellow. When you think that this suddenly somebody's just emailed you out of nowhere and said, "Can I come and interview you?" and he's gone, "Yeah, come to my house, no problem. I'll make you a cup of tea." Um, we're, we're nuts, really. Yeah. And um, did you did you interview anyone who didn't make the cut? I think you said it earlier, but did everybody, everyone who you interviewed, took part in the film in somewhat in some just, way? Just supporters. Yeah. So including my dad and my uncle, which was a really tough conversation to have. <laughs> 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 didn't make the film. Um, but yeah, we did um, two days of supporters at the uh, miners' hall in town, um, and yeah, the, the, so there's a few fans, but everybody we interviewed. Properly, I think everybody made the cut. Even if one line, even John Helm. Who a special thanks to John because John um, re-recorded all the commentary on the video for us. Certain bits, he did it all for free. We met him at Valley Parade and we did it in a box, and he just recorded it all. Um, so yeah, so again, we're very lucky that people just helped out. Mm. And, and and how hard was it to keep the language PC throughout all the interviews? And, and which which player struggled the most with that? We were lucky, really, weren't we? It wasn't too mm. bad from memory. I mean, luckily, we didn't interview Shaz. Well, that was <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I think bad. everybody kind of knew. It was interesting, actually, because the conversations that you had off camera were yeah. very, very open, let's say. And, like, being... So, like, I were only eight, nine years old when this happened. So these are my heroes. These are the ones that like I've got autograph books and whatever else and that you looked at them as like these, um, put them on a bit of a pedestal, but then actually meeting them beforehand and chatting and afterwards. But it were interesting watching like a bit of professionalism from them. So as soon as the, the cat, there was not there was not a fella that you sat down with and you went, oh, that's not quite right. Or he didn't look good on screen. Or he weren't able to talk. Every single one of them was articulate, passionate, professional. And I think that kind of ties back to the team at the, at the time as well. Because like, like I said, we said earlier on, what you had there from everybody that we met was a, a group of just really good blokes. And like, that were smart, that cared, that were articulate and obviously talented. And you can see why they were successful. Like you can genuinely see why speaking to them all individually, they were so successful when they clicked together. Yeah. And uh, this this is one that we'd love to get on live from Redfern's Bar. But did did you manage to ever track down the elusive Clint Marcel? Oh, it's the one. We haven't been. It. It's the one. I that is the it. one. You would not believe how many nights we spent up like texting each other, looking oh. at the cheapest ways to get to Trinidad, because <laughs> Liam found him. We had him. Spoke to him. He agreed to do the interview. And we had to make the call of, is it worth spending the money that people have donated on me mm. and him flying to Trinidad? <laughs> but, it was, but to be fair, it was more than that. We'd agreed a date. Yeah. Like we'd agreed that we would, um, we'd hired a room in some posh hotel in Port of Spain. Um, we'd lined everything up. We were going to fly to, we we're going to fly via Miami. Um, we we're going to come Thursday. back via Lisbon. You had to go and see Yovo. So like we we're gonna like we we're gonna tie it all together into this sort of multi-continental trip of uh, 48 hours to fly to Trinidad back to Lisbon for two hours and then back to Manchester. Um but then Chris bottled it because it was Mother's Day and he thought he might end up getting divorced. So we ended up being doing it. No, it's bizarre. No, but actually, forget about it, because of obviously COVID and everything, there was another weird virus going on at the time, and we decided it wasn't worth going. Zika. The Zika virus. And Trinidad yeah. and Tobago was quite a, a hard hit place. So that was one of the reasons that we decided not to go. It sounds like a Nigel yeah. Spackman signing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah <you> <laughs> Good left back. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 another central midfielder. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Surely. Um, that's, that's really interesting because uh, there's a lot of people come through to us on Twitter saying, get Clint Marcel, get Clint Marcel. Um, look, there's, oh, there's one so plot. There's one player who brings a lot of mixed reaction now, um, but he heavy, heavily featured in the film. And I, I thought personally it was great to hear from him. And that's Chris Morgan. Was it difficult approaching Chris after everything that had happened with the Ian Hume incident? We spoke Not about it. It wasn't, we never thought it would be a problem, did we? No, I think we, we like you just said, we had this conversation because we know how emotional play, people can get when it comes to the football club, etc. But we thought, we had to kind of detach ourselves from being supporters and we had to tell the story. And Chris actually plays a massive part in it when you consider that that was 
that second half of that season was his sort of debut when he sort of came in. One of the players that got sent off versus Liverpool played away at Old Trafford in the FA Cup. And actually having him and Scott Jones on the same day talking about their upbringing when it came to Eric, the what it was like coming into that football team as a sort of 19, 20-year-old. Um, and you think, imagine how many 19-year-olds made the football, the, Premier, the professional debut in the Premier League now? You forget how what a career he actually had. And do you know what? One of the most genuine, honest um, and just lovely blokes you could not meet, you could not wish to meet. And he was so open with his time and his honesty and he was was fantastic, weren't he? Yeah, and his passion for the club still is there. He's still a Barnsley fan. You know, he still is a Barnsley fan and we spoke to him, he was fantastic and he came later on when we had a a, a deal at the theatre and he was cool, he was good. Mm. So, so, so no nerves on his part. He was more than happy to just throw himself into it and give you everything you needed. Yeah, yeah because like Chris said, then I think it was fascinating because it is so obvious he's still a red, and it's so obvious, so obvious as a Barnsley fan. So you can't you can't imagine what it must feel like to have people think and say some of the stuff that's obviously happened. An incredibly unfortunate incident, but you think. It must be hard for him knowing that he is a Barnsley fan deep down and um, that he spent such a massive amount of his life at the football club for him to not then be held. I, I, he's absolutely not held in the high regard that he should be, in my view, because of that incident. And it's understandable, but it must be hard for him. Yeah, and, and as we saw when we shared the Brendan O'Connell videos, he's, he's the ball boy behind the ball, behind the goal going mental, and we. Yeah, exactly. He's there, second, like a, yeah. Like a um, well, we're going to the third clip. So we've got we've got a funny three minutes here with Chris talking about being a youngster and making the step up to uh, training with the first team. I'll not try and turn the volume up this time. Team. So, um, you know, I remember actually finishing one training session with, with the reserves and the first team were due to go down to Exeter for the pre-season trip. Uh, and me and Rory Prendergast, we got, we got called in from the reserves, you know, uh, it was Danny. Can we go in and, and see Danny in his office? He said that we were going on the trip. Could we nip home? Could we get his bags packed, etc., and get ready to travel the next day? So, you know, that, that was that was great. You know, sort of from my point of view, you know, a 19-year-old lad gone back in expecting, you know, to be training with the uh, the reserves, thinking, you know, it's now a Premier League club. There's loads of players coming in, and, and you think that you're going to be even further away from, you know, getting getting a breakthrough. So that was. That was a real important time in my career as well. That that first time to be invited with the first team, uh, you know, went home, told my mum and dad, all excited, packing a bag. What do I need? You know, never never been away really a pre-season. So you uh, you know you're packing your bag. You end up probably taking a, a suitcase that you take for a two-week holiday for <laughs> for a five-day trip because you're thinking, make sure I've got everything. Um, but yeah, just just a real exciting time. Um, do you want to cover that little story about yeah. uh, Exeter? So yeah. Over to you. Yeah. So, you know, um, we'd, we'd had a game. Uh, we'd, we'd played, a, I think it was, I can't remember whether it was a, a local team who we'd played down there uh, or whether it was when, when, when we played Yeovil. But the following day we had a recovery session. So uh, Eric Wynn Stanley took the uh, recovery session. So no boots needed, just, you know, bring your, bring your trainers. We're just going for a light jog, uh, extra, uh, stretch, etc. So uh, we're jogging around this, uh, around this park in Exeter. Uh, lovely sunny day. So Eric's got us all laid down. Can everybody lay on the backs, close your eyes, everybody relax. Just feel your body sinking into the grass. My voice is gonna get quieter. This is Eric talking. So obviously we're all laid on the grass, eyes closed, laid back, feeling us bodies drift away. Unbeknown to uh, me and obviously the other young lad, Rory Prendergast, who travelled, as Eric's doing this and saying my voice is going to disappear, he's going around tapping all the seniors. Come on, get up, get up. So uh, after about sort of, we felt like 10, 15 minutes, probably only about five minutes, I'm laid there thinking, yeah, I'm nice and relaxed. 
and I'm sure it was Nicky's voice, and I hear Nicky shout, Mugs! Like that. So I've sort of shot up and looked, and all the lads other than me and Rory were the other side of this park, and obviously they'd done me and Rory a kipper. We, we were just laid there like, <laughs> like two clampets on the grass, and uh, the rest of the lads had all cleared off, and uh, yeah, found it uh, highly amusing that they'd done a, a, doing a trick on the two young'uns. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant one that. <clears throat> um, so look, look, look the, um, we'll move on now. Like the relationship between Barnsley and supporters, you know, we all think it's a special one, and I'm sure every club tries and says, to say the same. But did you get the impression from the interviews that there was that special bond between players and fans that you might not get in other teams? Very much so. Yeah, mm. it was just. I can only speak about the people we met and interviewed, and I've mentioned it before. But the feeling they had for the club and the support, and how much they they still look back on it fondly now, just shone through in the interviews, both on and off camera. They were on it. They were just so. And at the premiere and stuff like that, they came up to us and like thanked us for making this because it's something that's. Especially Danny. Danny came up to me on the at the premiere afterwards, and there wasn't many people left, and he just said, uh, "Thank you for making it," and like shook me hand, and I was like gobsmacked, like a hero to me. And he just said, "It's something that his grandchildren will be able to watch, because that's his finest achievement as a man, you know." And that is that'll be in his family yeah. forever now. Yeah, and I think also he, he thought I can get a cheap Christmas here because he, he asked for about forty DVDs that we had to send <laughs> to him. That he could pack, that it could once we released them. Um, I think what's interesting actually about that period is that it's right on the cusp of, it feels like a different world. Like 1997, 98, like most people didn't have internet in their house. Like the fact that a club call was still a thing that most players lived in the town, they still went for a pint after the game, there was still sort of that. It was a different era, but it was probably the last sort of, the last couple of years before it became modern football, as it were. So you had like that, you had Zola who had just come along. You had like the start of this sort of foreign influx and the change of the game. The f the money was starting to flow in from Sky, etc. But we almost just missed that. Just, um, but I think like Chris just said, the fact that we did miss it and we were still we had players in there that had won. I mean, you forget that Paul Wilkinson had won the first division. He'd won the Premier League in like the mid eighties. Um, he he came to play for Barnsley. So that we were right on the cusp of a new era and we were able to sort of take the best out of both sides, I think, and that they were really part of this community massively. And and, and look, I know, you, I know you managed to get some Red Reds fans involved in the film, including Redfern Bar, very own pint pouring hero, Derek. I'm not sure why, you, I'm not sure you, why I left him in, um, but was that, was that an open invite or did you approach fans individually? It was an open invite. We put it on social media, didn't we? And Facebook and Twitter. Mm. And we said to people, if you've got a story, if you've got something you really want to say and get across, then, across, then this is where we're going to be for two days. And we asked people to contact us. And we gave them all time slots. And they slowly dribbled in. We begged and begged to get women in, to try and get a female voice. And we ended up with just one. Mm. Emily did it, thankfully. Um, but yeah, we tried to get, we're asking anybody who knows, anybody to come in and just tell us a story. And we got one uh, one female and she was great. And Emily came in and did that. But yeah, the rest of it was just obviously uh, Derek Simon's dad who did the music. Um, so he came along and it was great. Mm. Was, was it hard getting the right snippets from the fans? Because I imagine some of the stories will have been quite similar. So I've got to imagine that you're filming for hours of content, just just waiting for someone to give you that bit of uniqueness. Not really, because the emotion is what get makes it. Like what we were looking for from supporters were just those little sort of uh, snippets and stories and emotion to be able to sort of go on top of the um, sort of factual elements that the players and staff had brought along. I mean, the fact that we had five or six interviews and you had um, Ian talking about him passing out when Clint scored. You've got like. Um, You've got Ron, who is Chris's uh, father-in-law, sort of bursting into tears. Like, none of this is planned. Like, we literally, we had three or four questions and each of those people sat with us for 10 minutes. We're like, tell us your memories. What do you remember of this? And how would you sum it up? And the fact that so much emotion just came flooding out of people, um, there wasn't anybody that we got in you thought, no, nah, I'm not quite sure. We couldn't get everybody in, but um, it wasn't, it was never a challenge. It really wasn't. And, and, and which players, when you spoke to them, which were the ones who really, really spoke most highly of the fans and that bond? 
Redders, obviously. Mm. Obviously, Captain Fantastic. Um, the local lads, obviously, Nick acknowledged he got a lot of stick to see if he was come overweight, but obviously, he loved the fact he was playing in front of his, his team, his home crowd. Um, and, uh, Jan, Jan comes across really well. You know, I went to speak mm. to Jan and he tells this great story, which I think I sent him. Um, yeah. Tell that which you got. Is that one you're going to the clip? Yeah, on? that's what we've got coming up next. So I won't, I won't mention it, but he tells this great story and you could see what it meant to him and he, he still feels that bond now and like now because obviously my job I do Champions well I used to do Champions League football when there was Champions League football um, I can be on like the touchline at Anfield before a game and he comes straight down you know and it's, it's fantastic he's such a nice guy such a nice guy well look we'll, we'll play that clip now this is a, I think this is a really special one I mean obviously some of this I think all these clips have not been shown in the film so I think this is a really special one but it just captures everything that we just spoke about in terms of the town and playing for Barnsley etc so let's give this one a bash The brand of Barnsley was very important for me because when I, when I see back on my career now, I've been fortunate to play in four different countries and I played in 10, 11 clubs. But that part of it, coming to Barnsley, for me, that was like, a, maybe a cliche, but all these films, the mining community coming out of their, their mines and they get a football team and uh, to, to cheer. And when I, all I do after my career now, I. I, I do a lot of different stuff, but I always use that kind of thing in my head because I think that football can change the world. I think sport can change the world. And if I work with politicians, if I work with commercials, whatever I do now, I use that as, a, as, a, as an opening for what I do. So when people ask me, so you don't do football? No, I say I do football more or less all the time. And that thing with Barnsley, that we were going away, and I have told this story 100 times around the world, to be fair, about us in the, the yellow shirts, and the mining community, Barnsley uh, as a town, and it's just like watching Brazil. I think that, first of all, it says a lot about the English football culture, but it also sa says a lot about the English society, uh, about the way people are, see football as a, as, a, as a passion for their lives, and whatever difficulties you have in your life, if you lose your job, whatever you do, Football is still there to give you an hope and identity. And I think that, that what the football team did for Barnsley Football Club, now for the, for the Barnsley community, I, I think that was amazing. And I, and I think maybe from all the places I've been, I've been fortunate, I, I played in Swindon when Swindon went up. Uh, at Middlesbrough, that was a new stadium going into that. And, and Sheffield United, who have been over the years uh, a, a big football club, but in Barnsley that, that identity was so open and you saw that on a daily basis, that identity of the, the people of Barnsley. So, so I think that is very, very fun memories. Just, just on that one, Ben. Um, yep. I think there's a bit of a special fan queue because like we think people that you don't realise that make this stuff happen. But Jan flew into us from Oslo for the premiere. Um and he arrived at sort of Manchester Airport at like nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, and my friend Don Wood in return for a ticket to the premiere, went and picked him up, like left his house at five o'clock and acted as a chauffeur for the day. So Paper, yeah, he'd, kit, he'd kitted out the back. He remembered that Jan was obviously this intellect, so he'd got the times and he'd got all these broadsheets on the back of his seat for him bottled water and um, wanted to take him around the town. And just the, the fact that he'd gone and done that made a massive difference to us. And then he went and got Chez, who asked for four kind of uh, special bro, I think, rather than a bottle of water on way over. So um, just them little sort of things that the only way that this could have happened was by people just going over and above to make it. So just... The, the fact that he did that was massive. It's interesting because I know I know you never read the questions, Dyson, but you've just you've just stolen my thunder. <laughs> you've just stolen my thunder on the Sorry, next. Mate. Uh, <laughs> it's no. all right. So my next question was going to be: There's always unsung heroes in every project oh, yeah. or every walk of life, and I was going to say who were the unsung unsung heroes in the making of this film? There's so many people oh. in our in our little team that we had. We wouldn't be able to even make the film without Simon Lindley, 
Jamie Warman, Matt Goodwin, Liam Swan and Mike Eccles who edited it. That little group, we spoke until early hours, you know, more, a lot of days, just working through Mental. stuff, sending things back between each other. And everybody brought something to it. And without one part of that, we wouldn't have been able to make the film. So we were really yeah. honoured that people had that. And even beyond that, like the obviously that's the core group that created it, but even just like enabling it, like the we had so many conversations with people, so everybody was so welcoming with the time. So Johnny Owen, who was the director of um, Don't Take Me Home and the I Believe in Miracles docs about you know, uh, Notts Forest and Wales at the Euro, spent a good few hours chatting to him. Um, we and even just people that we got to know just on email that worked at the libraries that were able to get as archive and were able to just sort of even that odd word of encouragement to say mm. I'm really looking I'm really looking forward to this you know like mm. it was it was massive absolutely massive people who got the kit from gave us special prices everybody who worked at the lamp room when it finally got finished oh, all the days there, and they were just oh. incredible with us because I've never been as nervous in my life. Was that first night? Oh, we were awful, weren't we? <laughs> yeah, but they helped us from day, from minute one to the last minute to put on, I think it was 11 or 12 nights or whatever it was, um, and it was incredible. Yeah. Do you know what? Do you know? Do you know what? I've not got a single question about the premiere event and all those nights at the lamp room. I mean, that what what, oh, an, achi- what an achievement yeah. that was. I mean, how how yeah. draining was it? It wasn't oh, draining. But... It was like the 10 of the best nights I think I've ever had because every yeah. night I went every night but one when I was working and you'd. With different people came on. I mean, the premiere on itself was special because of the people who were there and the after party and everything that went on was amazing. But then just the normal nights we had it on, just the reaction people had and seeing people when they were leaving or being in tears. And obviously when you take this long to make a film, we'd put things in we thought were funny in certain parts. But when you've seen it 30 times <laughs> in the end, you stop, you start thinking, is it funny? Is it? And then we could sit in the bar every night when it was on and you could go and laugh and people would laugh. Yeah. And laugh. But um, Chris is lying though when he says that he weren't nervous because I'll always remember that um, we had a bit of a special preview with the day before, or like the Friday before the um, premiere, and both him and I were convinced that the like the machines or like the system that were being used to play it at the lamp room were just going to blow up. Like we were convinced that everything had gone so swimmingly to get to that point that. Um, on the night that you were pressing play, that it would just blow up, and we had all these people who had flown in and spent had come in to see this thing that we were just gonna balls it up. So genuinely, like my my daughter was born three months later. I think I was more nervous that Sunday afternoon um, <laughs> of that premiere than I was sort of the than ever coming along, and I were I were bricking it that day. Don't don't get me wrong, but um, the fact that we'd spent so long and so many people had come along to sort of make that happen you kind of felt like you didn't want to let them down um and even right until the end i was still nervous because you almost think that people aren't going to like it yeah. but it got a standing evasion and i remember nearly just bursting into tears at the point when it had finished um it was genuinely one of the best yet nerve-wracking days of my life without a shadow of a doubt well i can see chris nodding at the same time so you're you're in you're in universal agreement there in, in interviews we've been doing over the last six seven weeks the one name that always comes up from anyone who was at the club when he was there is Eric Winstanley. It comes up time and time and again, you know, really important figure, really influential. Everyone just speaks of his importance at, at Oakwell. Was that the same when you were speaking to people doing all the interviews? All the time, wasn't it, Liam? Yeah, and even talking to him, obviously, like, Eric came along and gave, like, generously gave us his time to um, be involved in it, but I think it's very hard or it's very easy to underestimate the criticality of people like that in football clubs, in any organisation, sort of those people that have been around a while and whatever else. But in football clubs, like Eric was that link. Eric was that person who had done the the graft in the in the background, had pushed people into places that they didn't, that they didn't think that they could be pushed, had made. You talk to everybody that was coached by Eric, they all say t- to this day that he was the best coach they ever worked with. And like 16, 17, 18, a hard task master, but somebody that helped them be better than their talent sort of deserved. Um, so he was a he was an absolute gent. Uh, there's plenty of stories where he was the, the coach and he wasn't a gent. He was a bit of a, a bit of a git by all the pirate, by all sort of uh, reasons. But 
overall, yeah, I mean, an absolute hero of this football club and this community. And I think it's it would not it would be fitting if the community and the football club sort of recognised that as well with Eric specifically. Yeah, and not to mention, it was also according to my dad, a very good footballer. <laughs> oh yeah, we're all right apparently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, look, were, were, there, were there other names that repeatedly got a mention as you're doing these? So obviously, I'm sure Danny Wilson got a mention, Red has got mentioned, but was there anybody else who, whose name just propped up all the time? Uh, Chez. <laughs> in the <laughs> in, yeah, a lot of people mentioned Chez just for off the field, not just off the field because everybody said about Chez, hard as nails. But an incredible footballer, you know. And, uh, that, but... I think um, you again when you're watching clips back, you forget, or oh, you didn't actually realise how good he was. And I remember after the he came to the Premier, like he ignored the dress code and turned up in a t-shirt, asked asked for his mate to come along, and we all got hammered at like till three o'clock in the morning afterwards. But um, he was he came up to us afterwards because we'd we'd asked him to um, get involved. And he pulled out last minute. He said he had something to do. Mm. And he came up to us and said, like, I thought it was just going to be a bit of a student film, so I couldn't be bothered. Um, but I'm gutted that I'm not involved. But again, he was one of them that came up and thanked us and were like, thank you. Because again, he's working on building sites now. We went to see him a couple of years later as part of something else. And that is the best time of his life. That's yeah. there documented for his family forever. I can still see him and Wilco at the premiere afterwards saying mm. why didn't you ask and we're like we did you said no <laughs> he's like ah oh. <laughs> and that both of them said that the time at the club was so special and it, they were disappointed they weren't in the film but we tried well look in light of big eric being such an important figure you, you've got a great tribute clip from from nikki danny and uh, ad moses so we'll play that one now and then we'll get on to the last few bits I probably won't, I wouldn't have had a career without Eric, you know, um, I'd have played at some level in some capacity, but I wouldn't have um, achieved anywhere near what I did. Um, he taught you the game, you know, people talk about it, you know, but Eric really did his coaching, his training methods. And I mean, listen, at, at times, there were times you, you, you almost hated him, you know, he used to push you that hard, you know, and when you thought you'd done and finished, you'd be doing more, you know. Um, Number of times we used to do 12 minute runs around the lake, you know, and you'd get back. You had to beat your, you're always striving to beat your last time, you know, and then you'd think you'd finished and you'd do another one, you know, and it'd, it'd say, if you don't beat, if you don't beat that time, you're doing it again. So you just kept pushing you and pushing you all the time. Eric knew the young lads anyway. That, that was a good thing about, um, about everything about when I came to the club. Eric was, um, was, a, was, a, was a real, real uh, source of information for us. Um, but also, more than that, the young lads who were coming in, they'd worked with him for a long time and they knew the standards that Eric had set. He was tough, Eric, you know, there's no doubt about it. he was tough when he played, by the way. I'm glad I wasn't told enough to play against him. But um, he, was, um, he, was, he was fantastic. And, and the knowledge he had of, of Barnsley, you know, as, as everybody knows, um, was second to none. You know, um, I think the only, one, the only other one might have been Rimo, you know, that's on, on that side of it. But... Um, but I think overall, no, I think his, um, his, his contribution was, was understated completely from a lot of people. He was, he was really, really the sharp end of, of everything that we did and uh, he was brilliant to work with. Pre-seasons at that time, under once Eric had got involved with coaching staff, uh, staff were tough. Um, we were running down lakes, kind of run till you were sick and then you were up that hill again and then Eric could think you're not worked hard enough you were back out that, that's what Eric were like and that's why all his young lads that had come through team with him um, had, had run through a brick wall for Eric um, say got scared of him really but massive amount of respect but that's how he'd, how he'd brought it up he were hard but fair like I said before with Danny half a team um, certainly uh, you know likes of me were in there Watty behind us Nicky at side of me Moggs were kind of on fringe at this point. Scott Jones were playing, so you know, virtually lads that had come through ranks together. So he felt comfortable if Eric were taking you, and he did that quite a bit with us and worked on us. So, so yeah, no, nothing. I think, like I say, I think Eric's a traditionalist, so he just stuck to what he knows and didn't try and do anything that he, he was uncomfortable with.
we, we missed that spring deadline, didn't we? I've just <laughs> seen it then, like coming spring 2018, only six months late. It was also achieving the unachievable there. Yeah. <laughs> See? Yeah. Uh, look, before we play the closing scene, um, what were the biggest challenges in putting the film together? And, and what strains did you both go through that people well, just wouldn't have a clue about? You know, as, as people that sit here and think it's easy. Uh, you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> so my little boy, Bodie, was born three months premature during the making of the film. So once we got through critical, well, obviously once we got through the critical stage, Liam had been doing all that stuff. I was up at the hospital for eight, nine weeks, like in special care unit. Um, so once it became apparent it was going to be all right, it was a matter of Liam would come and sit in the baby unit with me, <laughs> like a couple, and we'd just sit <laughs> in the book and just work through stuff. And the editor, Mike, in Leeds, um, would split the film into, say, 25 sections of 10 minutes and send them. And I would sit and watch, Liam would be home, I'd sit and watch 10 minutes, and I'd go, nah, change this, change this, change this, speak to him, he'd go, yeah, change that, change that, change that send it back, then he'd send them, do the next one, next one. And he just kept backwards and forwards for like two months. Um, so I have a lot to thank the nurses in the uh, maternity ward for because they put up with me, <laughs> sat on my laptop in a room. I remember one thing, I took my laptop up and I, we, he had his own little room and the incubator's on it, beep, beep, beep. And you just get accustomed to that after a while. And I thought, right. And I went and I plugged my laptop into the wall and the machine went beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Mass <laughs> panic, like what? And it was just a coincidence that something else had happened. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it's, it's not something every filmmaker goes through, but luckily, Liam was great and, and he, he'd come up and sit and we'd go through stuff or do it remotely and we slowly built the film up that way. So yeah, it's not something everybody goes through, but we had to. How did you get a pass out? <laughs> um, well, I think more than anything that she knows, well, like we'd obviously been doing West Ham Box for a while and like that, that took a lot of time and a lot of effort and we'd sort of thrown ourselves into stuff. Um, whether or not, and I think Beth, um, Chris's wife, would say the same, whether or not they realised just how much time this was going to take. I don't think we did either, if I'm being really honest. Mm -hmm. But um, the fact that they were so supportive, um, considering what it is, that we were trying to do something that was bigger than just for putting a few quid into our pockets. We were trying to do something that was like a lasting legacy for the town, was going to be an asset that people would that it's there now it's committed to film it's, it's permanent like the possibly the greatest achievement in this town's history we were we were collectively part of that team to put make that real and to sort of document that for future generations so um i definitely took a couple of ear bashings but i think they knew deep down that um it was worth it yeah and they got new dresses for the premiere and stuff so i mean oh, happy days and roundabouts <laughs> well, even though it's it's quite a serious film in the undertone and the, and the link to the miners' strike and what it did for the town, but but also it's it's obviously fun because you know it's about us getting promoted and pitting us pitching ourselves against the, the the elite of the Premier League. It must have been so much fun putting to, putting it together. And I guess what what laughs can you share that are suitable for the pre watershed? Uh, we did have a lot of good times. We had, we had, when we went to do Ariandi Zoo, yeah, we we. we, we the cheapest ticket we could get was driving our car, get on a boat, get over there. And on the boat was a prog rock, prog rock festival. Like all 60-year-old yeah. guys with big beards. Like We were just sat like this in the corner of the whole trip over and trip back. Um, but we've been very lucky. We also got to take the film to Berlin, which was incredible. Yeah. Um, so myself, Liam, the people I mentioned before, I went to Berlin and, and it, uh, it showcased at the Berlin um, Football Film Festival. Which is like a big deal. It was alongside um, take the ball, pass the ball, and uh, the Arsenal film and some other things. So for us, this little film to be in that same category was incredible. These films are made by like Universal Pictures, you know, and we were, it was just us. Mm. Um, and we put it on, and we were like, nobody's going to come to this film. It's been shown on a Monday in Berlin, and we're going five at five o'clock on a Monday afternoon. Five o'clock was like the last film of the yeah. festival, and we're going, nobody's going to come and watch this. And we, we we went. John Dennis came across to watch it. So we're thinking, oh, so oh wow. Yeah, so John and his wife came, so we were like, really like a bit nervous about it, and we, we turned up thinking there'd be us six and six or seven and five, six other people. And we got in there, we, we took the back row, this <laughs> sat there, and it filled out, and they were sat in the stairwells. It was sold out completely. And it was oh, that's amazing! Oh, it was incredible. Crackers. Um, 
so yeah, so that's that's a it's a great memory to always have that. And I think more than anything, what it has done is that the the lads that were part of the team, so Matty, Syme, Jez, Liam, and us two, we talk every day. Like still, t- two years later, it's. I remember, I can't remember who it was, but like one of the interviews talked about how going through sort of big experiences sort of cement relationships, which is probably why sort of so many of that sort of group at the club at the time are still close today and I still sort of remember it fondly. But the fact that we made this and that we helped create it is sort of cemented sort of lifelong friendships for us, I think. So yeah. um, that's a massive positive, for, massive positive from it. And uh, I heard last night a story on Dizou and he, he was quite familiar with the remote hotel that you booked for the interview. Can you can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was. It was. So we, oh, yeah. we checked the hotel. I said, yeah, yeah, it's a great hotel, guys. I'll meet you there. Don't worry about it. She said, all right, fine, fair enough. Drive there. Mm. And as he, as he finally turns up, we've got a little room set up in a room. He says, oh, uh, I've been here before. I'm so I said, oh, yeah, somebody got uh, shot or stabbed in the car park. He had to come and investigate it. And we were like, what? It's like, yeah, yeah, somebody, I'm here all the time. It's like a, uh, it's like a, one of these out of town hotels that drug lords and whatever else stay. <laughs> <laughs> he also, we also, so what are you doing for a job now? I went, oh, I'm uh, chief of, not chief of police, lead detective and chief negotiator. They'd been like talking to somebody off the bridge that week one night, you know, incredible. But, and an incredible guy. Like, what a fella. Guy. But one of the, the um, um, I was say, Matty was, oh, I was say that. Matty was with yeah. us, mentioned this, um, yogurt drink and a, a bread type or something that they only get in Holland. We were like, what are you on about? Anyway, he spoke to Aaron Dizzo about it. He went, oh yeah, I know what you mean. Harry goes after the interview. See you later, mate. Thanks a lot. We waited, had a drink and because his ferry wasn't until the night back. Phone rings half an hour later. I used to look at the hotel guys. We said, yeah, yeah. He said, wait there, I'm coming. Turned up. He'd been to the supermarket and bought the yogurt drink and the bread thing for Matty and brought it back for him to give it. <laughs> nice guy. Nice guy. Yeah. And, it, it, it summed it up, didn't it? Yeah, summed it up. And then just just thinking of some of our foreign contingent from that from that season, we almost had Jovo come into the Premier, if that's right. Yeah. How, how close yeah. did you get with him? Well, we paid for a ticket. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, again Facebook. So me and Jovo were like with best mates over on there, like happy birthdays and all that. Um, and we we were really close to going to see him. Um, to interview him for the film um, because again I just added a little bit of something different rather than a lot of like local voices um, that didn't happen but then um, we invited him over to the premiere he was nailed on he was booked on we sorted him his tickets we sent him his we checked him in it was all done and we had somebody ready to pick him up at the, ho- at the uh, airport and I think he messaged uh, was it the premiere or was it the civic night oh, civic. either or the Civic weren't it so we had obviously the follow on sort of DVD launch a couple of months later at the Civic um, where people didn't make the premiere actually came to the Civic so we had Andy Little who flew in from Portugal Darren Barnard drove up from the south coast uh, and you know was going to come to that but yeah he um, he messaged me sort of 10 o'clock the night before I think his flight was at 6.30 on the, the Friday or Saturday to say I'm sorry I'm not feeling great I'm not going to be able to make it um, the I think the reaction from some of the players was they were never coming. He only wanted, it were never going to happen. You saw almost like there was a bit of like 25 years later, still a bit of niggle between them all. But um, yeah, that were a bit gutting because it would have been great. Because again, he's it's, it's a bit of a cult hero for people, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And a little flew in from Portugal for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it feels appropriate now to play the closing scene at this point and then we'll have an handful of more questions and we'll bring it to a close. So, I'm pleased all all these years on that people still have such fond memories of it and I'm pleased that off the pitch and on the pitch we gave a good account of ourselves. Just immense pride, I have to say. Um, You know, proud of the fact that I were captain. You know, the the, the first captain, the captain Barnsley at that level. Proud of the fact that we come together as a community. You know, it, it meant a massive thing. Because it wasn't just about the eleven on the pitch or the sum or you know or, or anything else. It, it was about it was about all of us. So many happy memories, and it's one year, one year of promotion, one year in the Premier League. We're, we're up there. 
now for, for any football fan. People say, oh well, they went up and they came down. It doesn't matter, we got there and we had a great adventure. They left a lot of memories in the Premier League, the fans, that year. And, and so that was that was even better from my point of view, to go up there and it wasn't as an unknown, it was for Barnsley. And everybody knew who Barnsley was, it was great. For Barnsley and everything they'd been through as a, as a town with the sort of uh, the dispute and stuff with the, 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 the miners and everything. And I think it just made, it gave a real focal point for the town. It's not the fact that we've played in the Premier League or it, it's just achieving something that people thought wasn't achievable. And, and when you do that, it gives you an extra satisfaction, you know, and a pride. It's a way that everybody knitted together. There was a fantastic, fantastic atmosphere in the round. Every time you went out, every time you, you, you were um, talking or confronted by anybody, Barnsley, Barnsley, Barnsley. It was great. It was a good club, well run. Uh, the fans were great. And I just, that's what I miss. And I never achieved what I wanted to when I left. And that's because I had everything. Even though initially I thought, where the hell did I end up? Uh, I ended up at a, at a very warm, passionate place uh, with people that are rough on the edge, but warm inside. Premier League, you've beaten your Man United, you've beaten your Liverpool, you've beaten your Spurs. Their memories are magic. You can never take your memories away. You can't buy the memories, but you can never take them away from you. Welling up here every time I hear oh. that song. Every time I hear that song, there's like a bit of a like I, I get I go back to that week at the the lamp room and that final shot actually is where we'd been see Ken Launch and I think we were like half 10, 11 o'clock and we're praying for him to turn lights off because we're freezing at top of um, is it Grove Street and I'm like oh, come on hurry up lads but yeah it's it's nice memories. The uh, the best bit of the film the last bit yeah because everybody's even though the relegation actually makes the story. Because <laughs> if, mm. if you stay up, it, yeah, you get this little bit. The re, just, just the relegation, how people thought about it, and the people, the feeling they had, and the music and everything. It just ties in as a really nice ending. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, you can see why people are walking out in tears because you know, to your point, Tyson, you're welling up just hearing all those final mm. comments. It really, it really is emotional. But just fr from a personal perspective, I mean, seeing that closing scene and talking about it for the last hour or so. Seriously, guys, how, how proud are you that you've put something together that has had such positive feedback and left such oh. an imprint on the town? Incredible. It really is. It's the, the one thing I am most proud of, proud of, apart from kids. And <laughs> <laughs> adding that disclaimer um, in my life. You know, it really is. It's the one thing that when I'm gone, if it's in the museum or whatever, it'll still be remembered. Not just because of the money it's raised and the friends I've made, but just for what it is. It's just something that hopefully will be around for a long time and I think that I was just about to say like we, what we've not talked about is that this was not a commercial thing like every other film that has ever been released in the history of sort of filmmaking has been done because people want to try and sell it and make a few quid but this thing was done for the town and has then benefited the town and continues to do all that month in month out in terms of like the money that we've raised for the Tiny Arts Appeal, the neonatal unit, the food banks that we've donated money to. Um, and like Chris said, it is, I can't imagine professionally ever doing anything that will ever top this. Um, and I've got probably about another 40 years of working life to go. So um, I've peaked a bit too soon, I think. And, and, and you touched on it there. I, was, I deliberately delayed this question to the end, but just where, where are you at with how much has been raised for charity through all the hard work that you've done? We're about thirty-five grand, I think. Um, so, no, like, obviously, we're, we're still sell. We've still got DVDs for sale. Please buy them. They're still in the spare bedroom, and like, we could do. We're getting shut, but um, they are. We're still selling DVDs. That we're still posting them out to people via the website. And like I said, every penny that we get from those DVD sales is just going straight into local causes in the town. We donated. Um, I think it was the grand um, a couple of weeks ago to the NHS appeal, obviously on the back of COVID, we've donated money to food banks, we've, um, we've bought equipment for uh, local groups, we've done all that purely through the proceeds of the film. Um, so yeah, the, one of the initial aims of this is that we would release something that the town would be proud of, but also that it would benefit the town. And um, 
I think it will take we'll look back on this for decades and realise like just what um what we did collectively and what we did together. Yeah, yeah and, a, and a, que- a question for both of you, and, and this isn't in a critical way at all, but you know, just looking back, is is there one thing that you would change? Clint. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> The, the, trip, the trip to Trinidad. Yeah, I've had a four-week trip to Trinidad. <laughs> um, I think but, uh, every time, every time you watch it, there's always something where you go, "Oh, we could have done that a bit different," or "If we we could have asked that a bit." But we, I think you're always going to get that. Like nobody has seen that film as much as I have, and or as, as much as we have, or and that we've got so much sort of footage that we didn't use, or we could have used, or whatever else, and. Um, yeah, I, I would not change a thing, if I'm being really honest. Like, I think looking back, it's, it's ours and it means a lot, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. The first cut of the film was about five and a half hours long. Yeah. <laughs> and we were, seriously, and we were like, oh, no. <laughs> like, thinking, what are we going to do? And slowly just taking stuff out, and it really helped that the editor, Mike, um, who was incredible because he edited it from, he's a Leeds fan. But mm-hmm. having somebody with cold eyes on it just really helps. You, you just go, you've said that somewhere else, you've said that somewhere else, and that's what helped make the film, really. Yeah, because I remember the first time we got the running order back, and because obviously, like Chris was saying, that it was 25, 10 minute sections. And I remember sort of sat, sat with Chris going, How do we do all this? Like, how can I take three and a half hours out of it? And like even now it's an hour and 40 and most sports documentaries are an hour and 10 an hour and 20 max and we've added an hour and 40 an hour and 50 or something yeah um so yeah there was plenty that we we had to get rid of but like the the fact that we had somebody there that could give us that sort of unbiased opinion one massive one question one question that's uh, that come that comes to mind is Sunderland got their episode two what needs to happen for us to get ours a divorce. Need to be, yeah. <laughs> uh, two divorces and for us to be good at football. Like, I mean, yeah. that, they're two pretty critical things, actually. Um, yeah, I think um, we'd, love to, we'd love to do another sort of story. Um, like we've spent the last two years sort of trying to find something that we could sort of sink our teeth into. But um, I think if considering everything that's going on currently, um, I think if we were to ever be in a situation like that again, then I think that's the next one. That's the next big story. It'd it have to be something similar. Could could you see us? Could you see yourselves putting something together on the takeover if there's some kind of? Ro- I mean, you, like you say, we have to be good at football first, but yeah. some romantical story about the the uh, the Americans and the foreign investment coming in. Uh, I think you have, it's time is. Yeah, you need time to look back on things, and that's what helped with us. Obviously, you had the you had yeah. like twenty years, you know, to look back and say what's what. To do something now would just be fly on the wall and show it for what it is. You, you, you've got to wait till times pass to look on something like that. Unfortunately, and, and also I can't imagine making a doc now with all of the wall to wall coverage. Like a lot of what we included in terms of the archive was almost necessity because that's all that was available like if we were to go now and say sky sports give us everything that you that you know or every bit of clip that you've got about a band's football club it'd take days if not weeks to be able to go through it all yeah um but like chris said it needs there needs to be a story and i think that's why actually the what, what we've done is a perfect storm it was the context and the contrast of the economic situation of the town the romance and sort of the beauty of sort of danny coming along his first job that sort of the backdrop of Eric and Rimo still being involved with the football club. It was a very different time. And football felt different in the 90s. Um, and the fact that we were able to capture that and our football club was able to do what it did through that sort of defining time in history in the 90s where everything just seemed to be different was, it just made it perfect. So I think it'd be really difficult to turn around and go, right, we're going to do the same thing again, but 25 years later, if we got promoted, it's just not the same. Yeah. It's not got the same feel to it. And it's what somebody once said, it's, it's classed as a documentary, but it's not a documentary. Somebody once said to me, because the New World Bars fans, it, it's a love story more than a documentary. And that's what it is, you know? And I think I'd much rather make something that's like what we did than a fly on the wall thing now. Mm. Get it in the romance section on Netflix, eh? 
Yeah. <laughs> P- next to next to PSI, I love you. Yeah, the absolutely. Look, and uh, you both you both obviously really creative. You're both really passionate about the football club and the town and the people. There's been a fanzine. There's been a film. Are you, are you, have you got any other burning ideas that you're thinking of working on, or are you going to just stay you know, stay we, at home with the wives for a little bit? We always talk about stuff, and we've done little bits for the football club over the last couple of years, and. Um, we've got some. Well, we're just about to do something for a local charity called Project Fourteen, um, that's mm-hmm. just been put on a shelf for now. But hopefully, we'll be able to do that as soon as things get back to normal. Um, but yeah, we're always looking for stuff, and we've got a lot of ideas. But it's it's getting them in, into motion, really. Yeah, I'm just waiting for um, Mr. Conway to give us a bell and ask us to get on board. So hopefully, that's <laughs> the next phone call. <laughs> be a long way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, look, <clears throat> relax. That's it. We're done. Um, we'll have no idea how that came across to those watching until we jump off and see the feedback. Oh, in the I know comments. because I've been getting text messages all the way through. So don't worry. I know. It, I won't call it positive anyway. But that might just be my mate. Oh, that's your, that's your uh, lockdown beard. That's why. Must be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, look, massive thank you from me from the supporters trust, and you know, not just for going through this tonight, but everything you've done with the film. What effect that's had on the town, all the all the memories that people can look back on to your point about this is going to be around forever. And you guys have done a you're an amazing representation of the football club and the and the fans and the town. And you know, everyone connected with it is is really appreciative of everything you've put together. So just very, thank you, thank you from everyone. It's very kind of you, um, mate. And thank you for doing these, what you've done. You know, we've all watched these on nights when there's been nothing else to do. It's been fantastic. Um, yeah. and also thank you to everybody who bought a copy or came to see it because all that money either funded the film to be made in the first place or it's gone to a really good place. And the whole thing wouldn't have been made without everybody in Barnes that came together. And it's a real nice sort of metaphor for me, which is this town is better when it does, when it's pulling in the same direction. So like the fact that this was, this is not just a few people, this is everybody. So like, it means, uh, it means a lot to be able to look back on that time in his life and what we created, but also the, the knock-on impacts of this thing is purely from people partying with their hard-earned cash. And, yeah, it, it definitely means a lot. And, again, the trust were massive backers to us early doors. I mean, you guys invested to make it happen. So, thank you, lads. Well, look, um, again, look, thanks a lot. <clears throat> like I say, this has been a fantastic hour, well, an hour and a half, actually. So, thanks for giving us your time. And I hope you're not back in the doghouse after uh, a couple of years off. No, we're fine. Thank you very much. Nice one. Cheers, mate. Uh, all the best. All the best. Look, final final words to everyone before we oh. close. Um, if if you think about who scored the best goal at Oakwell ever, your answer is nearly always going to be Darren Barnard's left foot screamer against Huddersfield. And we're delighted that he's going to join us on Tuesday at seven o'clock. We're then going to bring a Samba vibe with uh, Dennis Souza on Thursday night. So hit subscribe on your YouTube channel. It really is the easiest way to stay up to date with everything that we're doing. Chris, Liam, top stuff and thanks again. Thank you. Nice one. Thank you, mate. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. And we'll be back on Tuesday with our left-footed Barnsley Wizard in Darren Barnard. Next three are left-footed, aren't they? All the left foot is coming up next. You can come in, we're just finishing up. What, it's because they're left? Yeah. I love how you both got game jumpers. You know you're still recording and you're streaming on YouTube, but sharp, isn't it? It's alright. Just going to give me DVDs, that's it, neighbours. Oh, getting, getting short. Great! <laughs>